Telecom Exchange CEO Roundtables, both for our guests joining us here at Telecom Exchange NYC, as well as our viewers who are joining us on Periscope, as well as on JSA TV. We'd also like to thank our Wi-Fi sponsor, Kelly Dry. Our first panel is on the arrival of Internet of Things, 5G, connected devices, data volume, and business opportunities. The panel is moderated by my friend Ronald Gruya. He's a perfect fit for this panel as the director of Emerging Telecoms at Frost & Sullivan. Ron covers topics such as 4 and 5G, SDN and NFE, IoT, as well as others. He's a regular speaker at telecom conferences. You may have seen him at Mobile World Congress and IT Expo, to name a few. He's also a contributor for Forbes, as well as written for thestreet.com, Silicon Angel, CIO Review, Information Week, and others. Ron, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Jamie, and I wanted to thank uh, JSA for the opportunity to be here. It's a pleasure. Um, so uh, um, we have a distinguished uh, group of uh, panelists here. So. Uh, uh, Frank Ray uh, from Microsoft, Mobin Ken from AT&T, and Tom Gilly from Momenta Partners. Um, I'm going to try to make this uh, this uh, session a uh, fun one. Uh, we have quite a, a range of topics, so uh, without further ado, uh, let's. Uh, how about if we just start by, uh, you know, we'll start with Frank and and go uh, go around until Tom. Uh, just make a quick introduction of yourselves. Uh, you know, just say uh, what your company is currently addressing or engaged in Internet of Things or 5G. Uh, yeah, Frank Ray, I work for the Microsoft Cloud and Infrastructure Operations Division within Microsoft. Uh, we work closely with our Azure division uh, with our IoT suite within Azure as well as all the storage opportunities uh, and uh, big data analytics. Uh, Mobin Khan, I work for a small company called at and um, um, We're headquartered out of Dallas. I run uh, products and strategy for our IoT uh, platforms and solutions, and um, uh, looking forward to having an interesting discussion here. My name is Tom Gilley. I'm with Momenta Partners. Just joined recently. I lead the ventures and M&A activities within Momenta Partners. We have about 20 companies in our portfolio for investments and a large number of companies in advisory services. Prior to Momenta, I founded a company called Wadio, which was uh, an application marketplace for connected device platforms, and I recently sold that company to Interdigital. Great, okay, so, um, you know, when we, when we were, we were sort of at a, an interesting point in, in uh, telecom uh, industry, uh, because we have these uh, huge uh, amounts of uh, data so I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Cisco VNI forecast, show of hands, or, uh, you know, Ericsson also puts out a similar uh, report. So we're seeing uh, uh, this huge uh, data explosion, uh, you know, the applications, uh, you know, videos, of course, one of the, the top ones. Uh, uh, then, uh, you know, when we start also looking at 5G, which is, uh, you know, it's interesting too, because uh, we're, we're sort of, we're not even done with the 4G uh, cycle yet, and uh, and for the first time in wireless history, we see uh, carriers like AT&T, uh, to name a few, uh, that are engaging uh, trials even even before the, the specs get uh, get ironed out. So how how would this uh, huge amount of data uh, affect our network infrastructure in the way uh, we, you know? Uh, we, do, we do business and uh, we communicate. So maybe, Tom, I'll start with you and then go, go around. <laughs> yeah, it's a big question. Uh, it is pretty exciting. There are a lot of things that are happening. Uh, one of the first things I like to say when I start talking about this subject is the idea of con connected devices transmitting data over the network has been around for decades. We've been doing this and collecting the data and making use of it in operational centers within the organization. And it's been going over various networks. What we're seeing today, though, is the increase of choice over the networks for this data. That's number one. So we have the carriers, of course, but we also we have satellite, Orbcom. I don't know if you follow Orbcom. It was trading at about $2 not too long ago. Now it's trading up near $10. Just had a successful launch of 12 LEOs, low Earth orbital satellites with SpaceX. Uh, it's a pretty interesting company. 
Uh, and then we have the conversation on low power radio with Sigfox and uh, Semtech, Laura, and there's others in the play. Those are the two I'm watching. Semtech stock is also uh, improving on the back of, of the, the, what it is that they're putting into the market. And a couple of other things we're going to talk about that are indicators of big change in the data across uh, the, the networks, such as the enterprise side of the organization, the business people within the organization recognizing that the operational data that they've been collecting for decades is useful. We'll talk about that more about in, in the volume of data. Uh, so it's a pretty exciting time. Well, yeah, so I think um, uh, uh, just to add on to what Tom said, um, the, the amount of data is increasing, but, in, but interestingly, the rate at which the data is getting generated is also increasing. So, so the second derivative, if you will, is just sort of increasing. So we, we are going to generate more data in a year probably than it's ever been created before. So now the, the question really is what is good data, what is bad data, what is useful data, and what's not useful data. So, uh, but regardless of whether it's good data or not, it has implications for companies that are carrying data or managing data or processing data or storing data because even if it's bad data, it needs to go through some network. Uh, it needs to go through fiber, it needs to go through cellular. And even if it's bad data, it needs, probably needs to be stored somewhere. Uh, because somebody is going to analyze it later. So it has implications on the network, uh, significant implications on the network. And that's why uh, standards like 5G uh, are evolving. Some of the, uh, the low power standards, whether it's Sigfox or it's CAT1 or CAT-M or narrowband IoT, they, they would um, collect small amounts of data, but from very, very large number of devices. So I think uh, data is, is will continue to increase, and I think the uh, it's important for companies like myself as well as Microsoft to, to help provide the infrastructure to manage that data in the future, and I think we're up for the challenge. Great, Frank? So, you know, uh, I'm not terribly concerned with the amount of data, and definitely Mobin is correct in, in the, uh, the creation of the data. I think that we're, we as an industry, uh, be it technology companies or, or investment companies, te telecommunications operators, we're going to find a way to, to manage that data, to carry that data, to transmit that data. I think the key that we're going to have to figure out is when you have, you know, somebody collecting data from, uh, you know, a, a farm of cattle, there's, you know, 5,000 cattle and they're in the middle of nowhere and they're crossing and sending that data to another company or a headquarters in a completely different geographic region and you're talking about crossing geos, crossing carriers, crossing networks, you know, how, how are we managing this exchange of this data, right? whatever volume that it is. So I think it's the amount of data, how it's being created, how it's being transmitted is really going to stress some of the existing business, business models that are out there uh, in managing traffic in today's telecommunications world. Great. Okay. Um, so I, I think this is a great segue for the next question, which is, um, you know, how, how are we storing and accessing all this data? Um, and also, you know, uh, you know, what are we going to do with it? Is, I know we're sort of just starting to see progress being done in uh, machine learning and, and such. Um, I know uh, Ray uh, Kurzweil, one of my favorite futurists, uh, said that we're close to that Singularity. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that concept where, you know, in machine learning, the machine actually becomes smarter and smarter until it actually could be smarter than, than us. And, and it was funny because I was just uh, talking to some folks that have, uh, you know, solutions in that space and they all talk about a kill switch where, you know, we don't let the machines kind of take over. Uh, just in case, right? But anyway, uh, so so maybe we'll start with Mobin. How 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 are we st um, storing and accessing all this data, and then we'll go, uh, you know, to uh, Tom and then Frank. Yeah. So I think um, bef before we get to the storing of the data, I think the important thing that we see from data creation point of view is that the biggest benefits are actually going to come from real time usage of the data. So if, if you were, you know, take Frank's example of a cattle. If you were collecting that data uh, in, in a localized way before, and now you have access to it in real time, take that on a fleet of trucks, take that on any asset that you are, you are connecting, um, that real-time data access allows you to make 
certain decisions faster, bring more efficiency to your operations, maybe even change the way you do business. Maybe I will rent out a tractor as opposed to leasing it to the farmer. I'll lease it by usage or I'll lease it by how much that tractor worked on a day. So uh, I think more than the storage, I think storage is an easier problem. I think transmission is a relatively easier problem. I think the, the important problem you mentioned, uh, machine learning, it's, it's all about how you t use that data in the fastest way possible so you can make faster decisions and make your, make your operations better than they were before. Right. So kind of like analytics on the fly, so to speak. That, that's right. Stream yeah. analytics or whatever you want to call them. I think that's, uh, that's going to be the key in IoT on how you use that data. Right, right, okay. Tom? Right. I see a few trends in the industry as it relates to data. We hear about data all the time. I'm at my family dinner table. My son works at Uber. He's a developer for the back end. The amount of data that they're producing is astronomical. They make that data open so that third parties can gain access to it. Uh, they're, they're have so much data that they have to move to different vendors to be able to deal with the growth of data. I can't be specific, but it's pretty impressive. Um, my wife was, uh, works in the office of the CTO at Microsoft now. Uh, she came out of healthcare. She did um, a very large project at one of the uh, large um, uh, healthcare facilities here in New York City. And a lot of data is locked up in data silos. and so. It, the big transition in data is to unlock that data from the silos and then make that available to other parties, third parties, for research. Uh, so there's, there's a pent-up opportunity to, to gain access to the data. One of my companies has, to get, talk about stress of data on the system, they generate over a petabyte of data a month, over 200 data centers across the United States, Canada, Latin America, and the UK. Uh, this is IoT data. Uh, it's a pretty impressive amount of data. Uh, that they're that pr producing and then generating results out of the data. And as Moveen said, the dealing with it in real time is important. Uh, having to uh, process that data as a batch is okay, but the, a lot of insight can be gained from looking at the data now. And what we see is, in, in the industry, is a lot of open source projects enabling companies, certainly the companies that I'm investing in, they come to market much more rapidly. Other companies like Cloudera, Mapper, Hortonworks that are creating uh, NoSQL backend data stores. Uh, we certainly have Amazon and Microsoft um, offering quite a bit of services in data storage and real-time analytics and stream processing. Uh, so I think the open source is an interesting trend. It's been a trend for the last decade, but it's in the recent years, it's being recognized in the VCs and the investment community and those large companies, even Microsoft has changed its tune on open source in the last few years, thankfully, uh, and has adopted and embraced it uh, sincerely. I think it's really important for Microsoft. I think we see these, the stock change in Microsoft on the back of many things, and that's one, one of the changes that I see. Uh, another thing I see with, for instance, AT&T, they're opening up APIs so that third parties and early stage companies can gain access to the services of a large operator. Uh, AT&T M2X is something that I know that several of my companies are, are playing around with as uh, being an interesting service for AT&T. And Verizon with ThingSpace and there's, there are other operators that are making major investments and making APIs available for data processing, data storage. And I think that's another important trend early. I'm not sure what the success is yet, but it's, uh, it's a good, good sign. Great, excellent. Okay, Frank. Well, I mean, I don't have too much to argue about what both gentlemen here have said. It's certainly definitely right. I mean, we have a couple of products to manage uh, storage of data and, and analytics as well. Um, I, I think one of the challenges that we're gonna have is, you know, we still, there's still so many devices and, and sensors that need to be installed out there um, I think the, the, the business is going to be stressed a little bit in, in how we collect that data, what the cost of that data is. You know, you talk about 50 billion um, devices. And if you look at the, some of the traffic and network costs that, that some companies have been suggesting, anywhere between $5 and $100 a year, I mean, that's an that's a astronomical number. I'm not sure exactly who's going to be paying for all of that. So I think that needs to be addressed in order to really get to a number of 50 billion 
um, and then collecting all of that data, storing that data, analyzing it is, uh, you know, I definitely think that's a technological problem that, that we're going to be able to solve. Uh, I think one of the challenges that we're going to see is a lot of these sensors that are out there, it's going to take a lot of time to gather all of that data and to be able to find any trends out of that data. You know, like one or two sensors monitoring traffic doesn't really do you any good. You're going to need, you know, thousands and thousands of sensors in a city and they're going to have to run over a longer period of time to be able to see what the trends are so you can then automate your systems for traffic flows in the, within a given city. So I think we're, we're, you know, I think we're going to see some challenges that really don't have very much to do with technology. They're just kind of tried and true issues of managing time and managing people and managing resources to be able to make the most out of that data. And, you know, there's only so many technical solutions for that. So. Great, great. Um, yeah, I, it's, it's, this is a, certainly a, a very interesting topic. And uh, I was uh, just thinking back to uh, uh, the comment that uh, Tom made about uh, open source. And I remember uh, back in 1993, I installed uh, Slackware Linux. And I was uh, having trouble because when I ran the F-Disk uh, you know, to do the partition on my hard drive, the physical and logical address did not match. So uh, because this was Slackware Linux, and at that time, Linus Torvalds was still a student at the Helsinki University of Technology, I sent him a quick email. I said, hey, this is not working. Can you help me? He says, I know what the bug is, because you have one of those uh, big uh, hard drives over uh, you know, one gig, and those, that 700 uh, mag barrier. And he says, I'm going to recompile and send you the binaries. So this is the part of open source as early as 1990, 1992, 1993. I, I framed that email. I still have it though today. <laughs> anyway, um, so, uh, you know, when we talk about uh, data and all this, uh, you know, we keep thinking faster throughputs and we think of uh, 5G. Um, and a lot of people, when they look at 5G, they say, well, it's just another evolutionary step in the wireless industry. Uh, and perhaps that's one way of thinking about it, but uh, maybe there's an opportunity here for, um, for that to also not just be uh, evolutionary but revolutionary, right? To uh, maybe uh, an opportunity to introduce new new business models. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, two-sided business models. Think of uh, maybe uh, girls' night out in a, in a pub, right? You know, the, the pub gives out the, the drinks free to the ladies, so hopefully more gentlemen will show up, right? Uh, the telcos, unfortunately, have been so-so in this, in this space. I guess toll-free service is one one of these two-sided business models where you, you know, you, you not only think about your downstream customers, but also upstream, right? And you're, you're offering free long distance for, for, for a fee, right? Uh, I mean, there's other examples, Entity Docomo with iMode, but, uh, but anyway, um, is, there, is there an opportunity maybe for, for 5G to, uh, to introduce this uh, new business models? And, and uh, what's, what's your take that? And maybe um, I'll start with you, Frank, and then move to uh, Mobin and Tom. Yeah, so I think there's definitely going to need to be some new business models by the telco providers to think about how they manage all these billions of devices. Uh, you know, you're, when you're talking about this level of, of sensors and devices, you know, you start to reach this critical mass where you, you you, again, you need to push the price down of the data to even make it more valuable. The, the, the value of the data does not scale at the same level as the number of devices. At some point, you start installing so many devices where the data coming from that device does not provide the same amount of value as when you only had the first set of devices in like an operational setting, for example. So uh, you have to keep the cost of that very low. And at some point, you hit a critical mass in which it costs you actually too much money to bill for that traffic or to bill for that service, then, then you're actually going to get for it or what somebody would be willing to pay for that. So I think the providers are going to have to take a look at, um, and I know some of them are doing them today, uh, you know, just having a one-time setup fee, not charging for any of that traffic. I mean, the individual traffic itself is going to be very small. Uh, it's, it's in the aggregate that you start looking at lots of data. Um, so, uh, you know, I think they're definitely going to have to take a look at the way that they're charging for this, how are they setting it up, how are they billing for it, uh, and maybe not always been the most uh, advanced in changing their business models or changing their biz biz uh, billing and provisioning systems in the past. So I think this is we're definitely going to have to take a look at how that gets managed. You know, when you, again, billions of sensors, you need to be able to turn them on, they need to auto-connect, they need to start sending data, and it needs to go, and it needs to be bi-directional. 
and uh, so there's going to be it's going to definitely be different than just having your washing machine tell you whether or not it needs a maintenance or not, right? So, yeah, the the the, the cost of megabyte of transmission continues to go down, just like sil cost of silicon continues to go down. So so that that you know from a from a consumer and an enterprise point of view, that's a good thing. Um, 5G, obviously, the more efficient technology, transfer a lot of data. But I think in the IoT world, it's, uh, I think, I don't know if Frank or Tom, somebody mentioned that, you know, we need all kinds of networks. It, it, the IoT solutions are not going to be just 5G or just satellite. There's going to be many, many architectures that will be put into place, whether it's localized mesh networks in unlicensed band, or it is a hybrid of uh, Wi-Fi in cellular, or or other architectures from a data collection point of view. And each architecture will have its costs and use cases that it will target, and, and hopefully those targets meet the needs and the ROIs of those use cases. So I think that there are there is room for, for uh, solution architectures in the home, on the street level in smart cities. Uh, there's the architectures deployed you know, globally um, as well as uh, for uh, um, for high speed transmissions, whether you are um, transferring uh, lots of videos, I think it's China Telecom or somebody deployed uh, an insane amount of connected cameras in, in in a few cities. So that's a tremendous amount of data flowing through the network. But at the same time, you cannot expect that those costs will be negligible, right? So those are going, so use cases will define the costs and the pricing and the architecture. So I think, I think over time, companies represented here and others are going to come up with ways to meet the needs. The, I think we're going to get to, if it's whether you believe 50 billion or 20 billion or 15 billion, it's a large B number, right. you know, over the next 10 years. And, and so there'll be many architectures to support those billions of devices that are coming. Thank you. Five G. It's an interesting um, horizon, uh, something that's happening in the future. So there's some unknown what what it means to what it is that we're going to be doing. I think Mubin, when he was talking about uh, multi transports and protocols, I do see that, and I think operators and those that are handling the transports are going to need to recognize that, and they already are, so that their customers are not burdened with having to figure it out. In fact, that's a part of the 5G horizon, is not just 5G, the technology, but what the operators and those that are providing the transport services need to do to, to create less burden to the customer base, because it is a burden. Uh, I was talking to Core and Stream Technologies, a couple of companies that do device management connectivity, and their biggest concern is the operators, uh, recognizing that it's important f f to manage the connectivity, manage the, the, the devices for the customer. Uh, I think that's probably true. I think the operators need to reduce, reduce that burden, and 5G could be that horizon where operators are saying, okay, I'm going to be a full sh service shop and move up the food chain and offer more uh, value than just transport, which also means the applications. Now, one of the thing, nice things about 5G is the promise of more bandwidth. Now, certainly that means more customers, but if there's an opportunity to put more data across that network, it opens up new opportunities in uh, markets that have been nascent because of lack of bandwidth. I think IPTV or security cameras is a really good example. However, I don't think it'll be security cameras as they're being deployed today where it's raw data coming across that networks. Security cameras are going to be much more intelligent, pushing the intelligence to the edge, fog computing as Cisco calls it. It's the idea of being uh, more intelligent at the edge, reducing the bandwidth and the backhaul to the, to the you know, central service but still need that bandwidth. There's, there's a lot of value in the analytics that would occur at the edge, and the faster I can get that back, the more useful it's gonna be. IPTV is an example. Security, certainly, but that's raw. There's so much information about human behavior that could be useful to the enterprise. Now, this sounds a little uh, big brother-ish, I suppose, but it's happening now. There's one small company that's growing dramatically putting park benches into cities. They know now how to sell park benches into a city. The cities are paying for these park benches. It's crazy. The park benches are self-sustaining, intelligent park benches that track human behavior on the park bench. 
They know who's on the bench, when they're on that bench, and they can pass that information not only into the city, the municipality, but then into organizations that can market services uh, directly to the individual. Uh, that's an interesting indication. Now that company is uh, going to expand. I can't be specific, but th th they've been so, so successful at getting the park benches in the municipalities, I can see some great growth in other non-intelligent devices that you see as you're walking down the street. Think about it. If every one of those devices had some intelligence, how are you going to deal with that bandwidth? I think 5G is a, on that horizon promise of cost and availability and uh, operator awareness of offering more services to the, to the industry. Fantastic. Okay, I, think, I think there's two interesting points that you made there. I'd like to hear Mobin's uh, thoughts on that. First is uh, moving up the, the chain, right? I don't, maybe had some t challenges in the telecommunications industry in the past in doing that. So I'd like to get your insight on that. And then the second one is moving the intelligence to the edge, but also the amount of data that you talked about that's being created. Uh, how, how and where is that being stored, right? How is that dichotomy being addressed? Yeah, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, so I think uh, up the stack is an interesting um, question for the telcos. Um, and, and we've been successful in some areas. We have not been successful in other areas. Specifically in IoT, we actually have made a conscious decision to move up the stack and actually working with Microsoft on a lot of these things with your Azure IoT team, um, where we are collecting and organizing the data uh, and then also making helping make some real-time decisions even before that gets to the infrastructure pieces in Microsoft. So uh, allowing the, 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 the users or the enterprises to code rules and logic so that less data gets transmitted or um, t decision is taken at the edge to what Tom was saying. Um, so I think those are, those are good trends. They will continue and, and I think uh, it'll allow uh, better, uh, better uh, solutions to be put in place. Um, what was your second question? How about moving the intelligence to the edge. Oh and how yeah, do you yeah. Store? So, yeah, that, that is that's really a very very interesting. Uh, in terms of the dichotomy of data, not all data needs to be stored at all times, right? So if 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 the if the value of a pressure is X and if it continues to be X in a time series way, I don't need to collect that. It's only when X deviates by. 3% and that's when it becomes interesting. So I think there are all these kinds of rules that um, you, you could, you don't have to collect raw data, but you just collect the deltas, for example. And so, so I think edge uh, computing and edge analytics allows us to do those kind of things and, and also reduce the overall cost of the solution, which is good for everybody. Yeah, actually, this is already happening. Uh, HPE just introduced the Edgeline IoT appliance which uh, is introducing that concept of moving the intelligence to the edge, and they're using Vertica Analytics, and um, they're also partnering with GE. And I think they have the solution with FlowServe. Uh, you know, they do those pumps in the oil and gas industry, and that's a huge uh, pain point for them. You know, how can we shorten the outage? Uh, Cisco is, by the way, also doing this, uh, and they, they're partnering with IBM, Dr. Watson, putting that <coughs> intelligence on the routers. Um, anyway, let's let's move on to the next one. Um, uh, you know, ABI research and uh, others uh, like Cisco have uh, done a lot of uh, forecasting. Uh, they, well, they talk about 1.6 zettabytes of data to be captured by 2020, and they're talking about 2025 IoT applications will have a total economic impact of about $11.1 trillion. So, uh, you know, what's the current investment climate for IoT services, and where do you see this uh, heading in the years to come? So, uh, Tom, since uh, you were, uh, your Momenta Partners uh, uh, <laughs> VC is heavily invested in IoT startups, we'll start with you and then go to Frank and Mobin. Thank you. All right. Uh, I guess a couple of responses to that question. One, I, I see organizations waking up that had been sleeping through this uh, marketing hype around IoT and, and the amount of data. Uh, two very different industries. On one side, uh, the enterprise software companies. We start to see it with Salesforce, SAP, Oracle, starting to talk about IoT, and that's great. But there's three that I would watch that are really powerful in the integration of enterprise software services. That's Informatica, MuleSoft, and Boomi. 
Boomi was acquired by Dell. Dell has now made a major investment in integrating the services from hardware to software and, and moving into the enterprise systems. Uh, you have MuleSoft and Informatica. Of those two, Informatica is interesting. They were public. They were brought private by a large private equity firm. Uh, so we don't know what the revenue is, but we know what it was, and it's high. They're in just about every Fortune 1000, mm, let's say Fortune 100 company for enterprise application integration. The large integrators, uh, Cognizant, Tata, uh, uh, Capgemini, use Informatica for organized the enterprise systems. They're waking up and they're recognizing that there's a lot of value that's locked up in the connected device data on the operational side of the organization. Uh, so we'll see in the next three years these organizations driving almost a, call it a data pull from the operational side of the organization to make it available to the business decision makers, the CMO, the CEO, the, those that are making the product decisions or the investment decisions in the organization. I think that's a big, big opportunity. Now, a completely different shift, another industry, electronic suppliers. Uh, they're the ones that are selling the chips, the devices into the markets. Billions and billions of dollars. These companies are Avnet, uh, Future Electronics, uh, Aero, Digikey. They've hired and, and staffed uh, IoT leaders. And they're trying to put together an end-to-end -end solution for their customer base, which is frustrated because they buy the device, the gateway. So let's say they buy a multi-tech or a cradle point gateway. What next? So they're looking to anyone to help them solve that, that problem. And for the electronic supply industry to say, okay, well, maybe we'll give it a shot is a really interesting indicator uh, of the trend in the industry and where investments are going to be made. Uh, the two investments, I think there's a, you're seeing more acquisitions. So there's now investments in companies that will exit. For instance, I just sold my company. Uh, there's been a large number of exits on the back of, of some you know, notable um, comparables and valuation on those companies. So more companies are looking to uh, present themselves for sale. So I think you'll just continue to see that over the next three years, which is exciting for me. I like to see that sort of activity in the market. It shows, it shows uh, vitality and growth. Right. Yeah. Uh, Tom and I had a quick chat before uh, via email, so it was definitely uh, uh, I like getting his insight on what's going on. Uh, you know, I think there's the way that we've been handling IoT. Um, I think we're just really on the cusp of of what's actually happening. I think when you start talking about the industrial Internet of Things, that's really where things are, are going to start to explode. Uh, but it's no longer going to be just kind of inserting SIM cards into devices or sensors and putting them out there. I mean, again, I think we have to really change the entire supply chain to, to get to a, the type of uh, volumes that people are talking about. And only at that point will we really start to see a lot of the value coming out. I know some of the companies that Tom's mentioned are trying to address that. Uh, there's one I think is very interesting. I, I, I'm, I'm Microsoft, I don't like to drop names, but I think there's one that's very interesting that's trying to turn into a global utility. Tom mentioned its name before. Um, and I think that that's being able to have this type of cross-border communication, cross-border interconnection, uh, and sharing all of this data, again, whether it's a, a zettabyte, a terabit, or whatever the, the total number is, um, it's that, that data is only as valuable as how you can use it, and you have to get it from A to Z to get it to somebody who's going to be able to analyze it and take a look at it. However that analyzation happens, whether it's done by a machine and spits out a report, um, it needs to be put into practice in some way, shape, or form. So uh, I think it's the exchange uh, of this data and getting it into the hands of, of machines and individuals that can then put it into practice, right? Whether it's sending the data from a plane that's in flight that's going to schedule its next maintenance because it's, it's finding out a delta in, in the engine. So uh, it's en route to its next destination and automatically scheduling the maintenance uh, and having that data then get to the right place to, and get to the mechanic that's waiting for that plane. You know, this is a, it's a tremendous amount of exchange of information from A to Z and all these different endpoints. And I think that we're really just at the cusp of, of how we manage that, both in the IoT space, but also within the telecommunications space. From an investment point of view, I mean, 
AT&T, Microsoft, Cisco, IBM, we're all suppliers. We're all coming from a supply side, so we look at the world with a uh, somewhat of a rose-colored glasses and because we expect this demand to come in. And so we are making investments, huge investments. But I think what's interesting to note is that on the demand side, companies are making investments. What that means is when I go and talk to customers, you know, there, there's a customer I talked to recently, they make uh, pumps that go on uh, fracking and rig sites. Now they are making investments, building a team inside that's going to be an IoT expertise team so that they can implement um, IoT solutions within their own product sets. Same thing on, I uh, uh, just spoke with the CEO of a elevator company out in Europe. and. They are looking to instrument elevators for many reasons. So some of them we're working on together. And these companies you know, are making internal investments because they want to be the consumers of IoT, not the suppliers, but they want to be the consumers of IoT. So I think that trend is increasing significantly, which is good for everybody who's in that business. Excellent. Okay. Um, so, uh, uh, when we talk about this uh, massive uh, data consumption, um, we could start to look at this as uh, one big uh, global network uh, pushing beyond satellites and south, uh, south towers, but uh, working together to offer maybe a more robust interconnected uh, infrastructure. Um, so, you know, what are the key ingredients uh, to deliver this, uh, this vision in terms of uh, partnership, connectivity, and security? Uh, maybe Mobin, as a service provider, uh, uh, we start, and then we will go with uh, with Tom and Frank. Yeah, I mean, uh, global is still a challenge in many places. I mean, it's it's getting better. So, for example, we have a, a, a global SIM product that you can pop into any asset, and you can track that asset worldwide. And we build that product on the back of a lot of you know maybe 500 roaming agreements we have across the world with all the different service providers. But there are regulations that are different across the world, whether it's privacy regulations, data transfer regulations. There are regulations about storage of data and privacy. There are regulations around, uh, there's technology hindrances around which bands in which countries. So for example, if we roll out um, the new CAT M solution here in a certain band, and that's not the same across the world, you know, how does a global manufacturer take advantage of that? They're not going to get the cost curves that you really want them to. So I think there are a lot of challenges in global uh, from simple things like multi-currency billing. You know, a customer in Europe wants a, a bill in euro and a customer in, in Mexico wants you know, bill in U U.S. dollars, for example. So th th there's there's a, there is a lot of challenges in having a, f a more streamlined uh, operational system from uh, a solutioning point of view. So I think we'll have to knock out those challenges one by one. But there are challenges. I don't want to say that 5G or some of these investments are going to pave the, or IoT is going to pave the way, and you know, everything will be utopia. It's just, I think it, there's a lot of there's a lot of challenges ahead on to be a global solution provider. Excellent, thank you. Uh, yeah, I think it's really important. Uh, we talked about that, how important it is for the customer base to be able to solve that problem of data across boundaries. And a lot of the Fortune 100 are in every country of the world. It's the, important to be able to solve that. I use 5G not so much as a technology, but as a horizon. I think for, by the 2020 time frame, we need to have really good answers to this issue of being able to move data and, and have access to data across international boundaries. There are some earlier stage companies that are addressing that. They're probably going to turn into acquisition targets for the larger players as they prove out their their technology set and, and covering the different transports, you know, low power radio, satellite, uh, cellular, and aggregating the data, dealing with the currency issues and the tariffs and the, uh, the radio technology differences between different parts of the world, which is, as Mobin said, it's a big challenge, but it needs to be solved. Uh, the market pull, the customer base is willing to pay for it. Uh, so I ex when I see that, I expect it will be, but it's not today. It's, we do have a horizon on, on, the, on, the, solu on a, the beginning of the solution. Great, Frank? 
Yeah, I mean, if you figure out how to have a global ubiquitous network, please call me because I have some <laughs> positions that are open. But yeah, uh, you know, part of my job is to figure out where all the toll booths are uh, in the telecommunications industry. Uh, no offense, Mateen, uh, Mabin, but uh, so as I said before, this the, the interconnection, the exchange of this data, that's really going to drive that. I think kind of the idea of having a global ubiquitous network, uh, moving all of that around, um, Still somewhat of a panacea, perhaps, but uh, you know, I still have faith that we'll figure something out. But as as Moby mentioned, you know, we we at Microsoft we have data residency uh, and data sovereignty issues that we need to resolve. So we have different types of deployments for our cloud, we have hybrid uh, deployments for our cloud, and and these look different from one geography to the next. You know, we, we announced not too long ago a deployment that we did in Germany that has, uh, and I lived in Germany for 13 years, so extremely strict uh, data privacy laws that are very different than just their neighbors right across the border. So trying to manage all of that and then having this uh, seamless transition of, uh, of your data across uh, regulate, regulatory environments, uh, government environments, security environments, currency environments, uh, I think we're still a ways off before we can just simply say, uh, I'm going to pick this and uh, it's going to look the same, it's all going to flow, and my bill is going to look the same, and uh, and I'm going to be able to fully automate that. So I think we, we need to get there. I mean, we're trying to do that at Microsoft. We are working with the folks at, at AT&T to try to accomplish that. Um, maybe I'm just a little bit, because I'm trying to figure out those problems, I can <laughs> see where, where yeah. the challenges are. I think we still have a, a, a ways to go, but it's certainly uh, it's good to set goals for yourself. Great. If I may add one, yeah, uh, sure. even without the global, just take global aside for a second, I think there is data sharing issues that need to be solved in the industry. So even within an ecosystem, to think about a heavy equipment manufacturers, you know, Caterpillars, Deers of the world, they sell through dealers who probably lease it to through some bank and then a farmer buys the equipment. Each of, the, there's data being produced in that machine that there's parts of that data that only the OEM, the manufacturer, needs and is not willing to share with anybody else. Then there's parts of the data that the dealer needs so that they can monitor the, the, the machine. Then the farmer needs certain pieces of data, and then maybe the guy who's, who's leasing the equipment needs certain amount of data. And are you using them within, within specs? Are you within warranty? And so on and so forth. We haven't really figured out. Uh, you know, how easily to solve it. No, what I.O. tried to do some of that uh, in, in your company. But, but those are not just global, but those are issues around how do you share data based on uh, permissions and, and the right rules and, and learning about the data. So there are a lot of data sharing issues that I think we need to overcome to get, get to a, a really good good solution out there. I'll, I'll just add, I'm sorry. No, no, I was just going to say, I think that's a good uh, example also of what's actually happening behind the scenes in the telco space. A lot of people think that, you know, you buy a service from, from carrier X and it's their network all over the place, but it's not, you know, they're buying network from this person who's buying network from that person. And, you know, it's, 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 it's yeah. definitely, definitely a very challenging space to work in. Sorry, Tom didn't mean to interrupt. No, no, thank you. Uh, you, you. You heard three different answers, or at least I heard three different uh, responses to the question. My first response was about the transport and interoperability of transport, and then I will be talk about the interoperability between the carrier services, and then uh, Frank and Microsoft, the interoperability of data and the different data laws across the world. So those are pretty big challenges. I think that's a interesting response at how difficult that challenge is and just have to figure it out, each one of those, to be able to create something that is unified. Something Frank said, there's not going to be a ubiquitous standard that cuts across all of this to solve the problem. Uh, one, of the things, one of the things I learned with Wadio uh, was that you, you need to have a solution that can deal with the multi-standards, the, the multi-laws, all of the things that are occurring and changing. There's nothing that's static, it's always changing. So the systems that are being deployed and in place are the ones that can adapt to those uh, standards and transports and change in laws around the data. That's, uh, uh, I've learned that to be very important. There's not going to be one standard that solves all, all problems. Excellent. All right. So uh, I know we're a little bit uh, out of time. It was just uh, one last question. Uh, but before that, just a couple of minor observations. I know uh, one of the 
uh, gentleman, I think, was it you, Tom? You mentioned the 50 billion connected devices figure. I think that came from uh, Ericsson as a forecast, and they have since uh, changed it. They revised it downwards, and then some people started saying, oh, well, well, I thought it was, tw it was 50 billion by 2020, right? And I think in the end, what they ended up doing is they, they still stuck with the 50 billion, but they just moved the, the yeah. timeline, I think. <laughs> right. uh, so, but, but, you know, that number seems to have stuck in a lot of people's minds. So, you know, it's amazing how much uh, the mileage they got out of that. Um, uh, you know, so uh, uh, maybe uh, I know we have uh, panelists for the next session already lined up here. So I'm, if you could please just keep uh, your answer short to a couple of minutes each. Uh, you know, what are, the, what are the opportunities that IoT will offer us? And are there any final predictions as to uh, where you see, um, you know, where you see us heading in, in that direction in the next uh, few years. Uh, I will just mention a quick thing uh, about IoT opportunities. Uh, this Earlier this year, I was at Mobile World Congress, and I saw Fujitsu. They had like a, almost like a fit band on a, on a cow. It was a connected cow. I was like, whoa, what are they doing with this? They are measuring actually how much uh, a, a cow actually, you know, walks around. <laughs> and I said, how is this useful to the farmers? Apparently, um, when cows are in heat, they actually walk twice the, the average amount that they do on a normal day. So that immediately triggers an alarm to the farmer. So the farmer knows, OK, because that's not a productive time for the cow. You know, those are milk uh, giving cows. <laughs> they, they, they take them off and they say, OK, you do your thing and, you know, and, and it's interesting, you know, uh, it's how this is actually a, uh, already being used by farmers in Japan. So, in, but uh, let's uh, let's start maybe with you, uh, Frank, and then go to Mobin, and then with uh, Tom. Okay, well, I'll try to keep it short. So, I think it's going to provide us with um, an incredible amount of analytics to drive a lot of operational efficiencies across uh, multiple <laughs> industries. Uh, it's going to stress the way that telecommunications providers, or I say network operators, uh, function from a billing, a provisioning, and customer service perspective. Uh, it's going to create a lot of new entities to be able to manage the, the, the way that data is shared back and forth across the different industries. Uh, and we're going to get a lot of cool names for things that are connected, like connected cows. It's, <laughs> everything will be connected. So. Yeah, I'd say that... Um, this is the uh, IoT solutions is more like the next wave of productivity revolution. So it's going to touch every industry. Every industry is going to change at their own pace, but it's going to change. Um, and, uh, you know, over the next few years, we will see many of the business models and many of the players maybe even in the industry change depending on how they adopt and use. So I think um, we're very bullish on this. Uh, you're going to see a lot of M&A activity. You're going to see larger companies buying smaller companies that demonstrated success. So that's going to occur and continue to occur over the next few years. Uh, we've already said that the large amount of data that's happening. The devices that are coming on the network are both Greenfield, those new devices, the connected cows, so to speak. Um, interestingly, cows are already connected. <laughs> there's a, lot of, there's, uh, a lot of the cows are already instrumented. Uh, what will happen, though, is that data that's been locked in the operational side of the organization is going to be pulled into the business side of the organization. I see that as a big change in how we're talking about IoT, moving from just operational awareness into business decisions and analytics on, on that operational data on the business side of the organization. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. It's been an honor and a pleasure to have such a distinguished uh, group of uh, folks here. And uh, again, I wanted to uh, thank uh, JSA and uh, Jamie for the opportunity. And I uh, hope uh, you, you got some good mileage out of this session. Thank you. Thank you.